to begin our program this afternoon, we would like to invite the disciples to remember this love is 19 and 20, where it says, Also he took a loaf, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This means my body, which is to be given in your behalf. Keep doing this in remembrance of me. And also he did the same with the cup after, and the make they had the evening meal, saying, This cup means a new covenant by virtue of my blood, which is to be poured out in your behalf. Yes, our presence here, dear ones, is actually in obedience to Jesus' commands. And tonight, in over 236 lands, a lot of our brothers and sisters and our friends are actually commemorating the memorial with us tonight. Some of them will be meeting in kingdom halls, others in assembly halls. Some will be like us, they will be holding their memorial in rented facilities such as this one, a very nice rented facility. But you know, others in a more difficult situation will be holding their memorial in private homes. In others, even in open fields. But it doesn't matter. That our brothers and sisters will strive hard, even at the price of their freedom. So just to obey Jesus' command to remember his loving act. So last year, we actually had an attendance of 20 million, this is in 2018, 20 million, 329,370. And this year, we are also looking at that number, if not greater. So all of you who are here tonight, we would like to give our sincere commendation for your presence. We know that a lot of you have adjusted their schedule, so ask to be here, join us. Others may be in a more difficult situation where they had to set aside certain activities for their preference, almost to the point of sacrificing something so that you could be here and join us in this memorial. Whenever we attend memorials, we know that it is in appreciation for that particular person. So really, our presence here is an appreciation for that superlative act of love that was given to us. And what should we expect tonight as we go with our program? Well, tonight we would like to briefly answer several questions, very important ones. The first one, why do humans need to be rescued from the curse of sin and death? That would be the very first question that we would answer. What about the second one? The second one would be, who will benefit from Jesus' loving sacrifice? Who would be? The third one would be, who will partake of the bread and the wine? The fourth one, besides attending this meeting, what else was, must we do to show our appreciation for what Christ has done for us? Now we will try and really expound on the answers to these questions so we can really fill our hearts with that appreciation for that superlative act of love that Jesus has expressed to us. Now, let's begin by answering the first one. Why do we need deliverance? Well, we know that our first parent, the first man, Adam, had a perfect beginning. Jehovah God gave him a perfect life here on a paradise earth. Everything was just perfect. His environment was just perfect. It was to his enjoyment. But in reality, his enjoyment, dear ones, is dependent on one very important thing. And what is that important thing? Well, that is his obedience to his Creator. He had to stay obedient to Jehovah God so that he can enjoy, continue enjoying the everlasting life that was given to him. But what happened? We all know what happened in the Garden of Eden. We all know that Adam did not stay obedient to Jehovah God. He disobeyed Jehovah. And that, because of his disobedience to Jehovah God, Adam personally lost the prospect of having that perfect, everlasting life that was first granted to him. But the bad results did not end with Adam. He, this is what Romans chapter 5, verse 12 has to say. I'd like to invite you to read together Romans chapter 5, verse 12. Where it says, that is why 
just as the earth. And the little ones certainly look forward to this one. The little ones will be part of that earthly home. What about some of our, our dear ones who are sick or infirm? What can they look forward to? Well, Isaiah chapter 35 gives us this wonderful hope. Let's also read that together. Isaiah 35, let's read together verses 5 and 6. It says there, At that time, the eyes of the blind will be opened, and the ears of the deaf will be unstopped. At that time, the lame will leap like the deer, and the tongue of the speechless will shout for joy. For waters will burst forth in the wilderness, and streams in the desert plain. Really, this is a wonderful word picture. It really depicts where in a scene that nobody, no one will become sick anymore. And even our physical disabilities will be gone. The blind will be able to see, the deaf will be able to hear, and even the lame will be able to leap and jump and really enjoy life on paradise earth. And such a wonderful thing here on earth. What about our fathers, family men? Do you have something to look forward to in the future here on earth? Well, there is also uh, something written in Isaiah chapter 65, verses 21 to 23. You might be interested to listen to this one. Isaiah 65, verses 21 to 23, where it says, They will build houses and live in them, and they will plant vineyards and eat their footage, and they will not build for someone else to inhabit, or when they plant for others to eat. For the days of my people will be like the days of a tree, and the work of their hands, me, my chosen ones, will enjoy to the full. They will not toil for nothing, nor will they bear children for distress, because they are the offspring made up of those blessed by Jehovah and their descendants with them. It's such a wonderful thought. Today, when fathers and family men will go to work, most often times he would just be making their bosses rich. He would take a little home just for their families. This is a very common scenario. One would work for the benefit of others. But here, on an earthly paradise, Jehovah promised that we will not toil for others. What we will toil for, we will enjoy to the full. Because that is Jehovah's promise. Really, something to look forward to. In this paradise earth. Now we can really see that this is the effect of Jesus staying here on earth. He saw the destitute situation of people and he really wanted to heal the sick and even he raised the dead. He wanted to deliver man from this very sad state. He longs to reverse the effects of Adam's sin on the human race. Now when that happens, can you see yourself in that wonderful world? Would you be? Would you like to be one of those who would be able to go to that paradise? Right? Such a wonderful thought for us to meditate. Now, we go to the third question that we are to answer tonight: Who should partake of the bread and the wine? Well. From our discussion, it has become clear, dear ones, that both those with the heavenly hope and those with the earthly hope would benefit from Jesus' sacrifice. Both groups, heavenly and earthly hope, will benefit from Jesus' ransom sacrifice. However, those with the earthly hope do not partake of the enemies. Now, why not? Well, let's read together Luke chapter 22, verses 28 to 30. Let's look at that particular scripture. Luke 22, 28 to 30. Luke 22, 28 to 30, it says, However, you are the ones who have stuck with me in my trials, and I make a covenant with you, just as my Father has made a covenant with me for a kingdom so that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones to judge the twelve tribes of Israel. And during the time that the memorial was instigated, Jesus actually was making a covenant with those who will have a covenant with him to go to heaven as co-rulers. So they are the ones who will partake of the emblems. They are the ones who have 
the heavenly hope. They will be the ones to partake of the influence of man. Now during that time, the members of uh, the 144,000 were able to partake of that. And during our time, only a few of those who still remain here on earth will be able to partake as well. But you might ask, what happens if all of them goes, goes to heaven? Will we ever stop celebrating the memorial? Will there be a time when we will end and not celebrate the memorial anymore? Well, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 26, gives us one of the comments. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 26. First Corinthians 11, 6 says here, For whenever you eat this loaf and drink this cup, you keep proclaiming the death of the Lord until He comes. Yes, it's very clear in this particular scripture that there will be an ending. Until He comes. And when Jesus comes, this is the time that He will take all the uh, all the remaining members of the 144,000 and they will, he will take them back home to heaven. And all of them will be there. And then the ones who will have the earthly hope will need to stop celebrating the memorial. Yes, that will be the case. Once he comes, those with the earthly hope will no longer observe the memorial. Because why? Because those with the earthly hope will not need to partake of the wine and the bread so that they can get the effects of Jesus' ransom sacrifice. It is not required for those who have earthly hope to partake. They are in effect, uh, they will uh, they will have the blessing of Jesus' ransom sacrifice even if they do not partake of the bread. And that would be the case. Now that we have uh, answered there are three major questions, dear brothers and sisters and friends. We are now here at this point in time when we will follow the pattern that Jesus has set for observing the Lord's evening meal. Now together, we would like to read 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and 25. Uh, before they passed the bread, uh, this is what they did. First Corinthians 11, 23, and 24. Sorry, that's First Corinthians 11, 23, and 24. It says here, For I received from the Lord what I also handed on to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night on which he was going to be betrayed took a loaf, and after giving thanks, he broke it, and said, This means my body, which is in your behalf. Keep doing this in the number of God. So Jesus clearly he offered prayer, and then they passed the bread. And we clearly understand that the bread, or the unleavened bread, represents Jesus' sinless death. So this is also what we are going to do tonight. We would like to call Brother Julius Malia before the prayer. Let's pray. For Almighty God, you move up from the heavens. We would like to, to thank you, dear Father, for giving us this great privilege to be gathered here together to commemorate the death of your dear son Jesus Christ. We would like to take to take this opportunity, dear Father, to thank you for your uh, loving kindness for all of us and sacrificing your dear son so that all of us can be saved. And as we uh, serve the bread, we please, part, Father, help us to analyze ourselves if we are uh, to partake in this emblem and uh, knowing that as what we learned from the top, the requirements of the qualification. Please, Father, continue to bless us well. Our, our dear friends, brothers, and sisters, many of them are celebrating this year. 
Please forgive us of your father for mistakes, for this we pray in Jesus' name. they had all seen. Yes, as you can see on the picture, because of Adam's disobedience, not only him, but actually all mankind, all his descendants, all his sons afterwards, had to suffer the effects of that disobedience. We all inherited that sin, and we were also <coughs> subjected to the consequences, which is hard times and even death. Such a sad, sad state for mankind really, because of Adam's disobedience. So really, it's a very important question to ask. What if there were right-hearted descendants of Adam? What about them? Would they be rescued? Would they have the hope to be rescued from the effects of sin and death that was inherited from Adam? Well, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7, really gives us a wonderful answer on this one. We would like to invite you. Let's read that scripture together. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7. Where it says, By means of him, we have the release by ransom through the blood of that one. Yes, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his undeserved kindness. Yes, mentions here that there was a ransom that could be given for us so that we can be forgiven for our trespasses. And this denotes our trespasses, the inherited sin that we got from Adam and Eve. And where would that come from? Well, it came from God. He gave us the provision of the ransom sacrifice of His Son so that we can be delivered from that sad condition. So Jehovah sent His only begotten Son so that all that would exercise faith in Him would have the hope of everlasting life. And in, in that regard, Jesus, Jehovah's Son, became the last Adam. Well, the first Adam set his descendants on the path of destruction. This is what the last Adam did. It, is, it has been uh, described beautifully in this particular scripture in Romans chapter 5, verse 19. Let's all read it together once again. Romans 5, verse 19. For just as through the disobedience of one man, many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of one person, many will be made righteous. Indeed, Jesus provided our deliverance through his obedience as far as then. While the first Adam became disobedient, Jesus became very obedient as far as death and was able to provide the ransom sacrifice that we need for our deliverance. But you might ask, dear ones, why did Jesus have to die? Because we know that the cause of death is actually inherited sin or sin itself. But Jesus was perfect. Why would he die? What was the reason? Why did he have to die? Well, the scripture actually gives us a, very, a wonderful answer on this also. We would like to really get uh, what it says in uh, Hebrews chapter 2, verse 9. So I'll read that together. That would be in Hebrews <coughs> chapter 2, verse 9. And as we read the words, try to meditate on the impact on our personal existence. But it says there, But we do see Jesus who was made a little lower than angels, now crowned with glory and honor for having suffered death, so that by God's undeserved kindness, he might taste death for everyone. So meditating on this scripture, dear ones, what, how do you feel? Meditating on what Hebrews chapter 2 verse 9 has to say. Doesn't it warm your heart to think that Jesus was willing to exchange places with you and me? He was willing to suffer. And he was willing to die 
for you and me so that we can have life. Really, that is such a superlative act of love. We would like to meditate and mull over that and keep it. But what kind of life you know, are we talking about? Would be would it be a life in heaven or would it be a life here on earth? Well, we'd, we will be going to the second question that we will be answering tonight. Who would benefit from Jesus' loving sacrifice? Well, the Bible actually describes two destinies or two hopes or for faithful humans. The first one would be a limited number and they would have a heavenly hope as properly described on the right side of the picture. And then the second one would be part of the vast majority will be enjoying a life on the paradise earth according to Jehovah's purpose. So those, those are the two hopes being described in the Bible. A heavenly hope and an earthly hope that would actually be here on a paradise earth. But the good question would be, can we choose where to go? Would you go and say, ah, Jehovah, I would like to serve you in heaven. Would you please allow me? Well, we can all decide whether we want to become members of Jehovah's family of worshipers. That, for sure, we can decide. But where we will serve? Jehovah will be the one to decide. He will be the one to choose where we will serve Him best. Why, how can we say that? Well, John chapter 3, verses 5 to 8 actually gives us a wonderful insight on this one. So let's read that together as well. That would be John. John chapter 3, then we'll be reading verses 5 through 8. So it says there, Jesus answered, Most truly I say to you, unless anyone is born from water and spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. What has been born from the flesh is flesh, and whatever has been born from the spirit is spirit. Do not be amazed, because I told you, you people must be born again. The wind blows where it wants to, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from and where it is going. So it is with everyone who has been born from the Spirit. Now we would like to focus on what it says on verse 7. It says there, Do not be amazed because I told you, you people must be born again. Now, when it comes to literal birth or being born, were you able to decide when you wanted to become born? Or was it your parents who decided that they will have a child of their own? It was actually your parents who decided. They were the ones who decided that they would have a baby. And when he came up, they start they decided to raise you up as their own. So as far as being born again into spirit, we can clearly and logically think that there's only one who will properly decide who is to be born again. And that would be our Heavenly Father, our Heavenly Father, Jehovah. But you might want to, you might say, but it says there must be born again. Well, how should we understand that particular word, must? Well, when we look at that particular word, must, we get to know two things, actually. The very first one, it might be describing something that needs to be followed. For example, you must eat so that you will not go hungry. But a second function of the word must is to actually describe a requirement. And how should we, how can we illustrate this one? For example, do all of you drive? Not everybody. But for those of you who drive, what must you have? You must have a driver's license. And not everybody is required to have a driver's license. But if you are to drive, you must have a driver's license. In that sense, for us to be born again, or must be born again, would be only for those who Jehovah chooses to have a heavenly hope. It is a requirement for them, not a commandment for every one. Such uh, a wonderful uh, spiritual gem that we can get from the Bible. 
So what else can we learn about those who have heavenly hope? Well, another scripture that we would like to go into is Revelation chapter 14, verse 1. In this particular scripture, we are given more insight as to how we can identify these ones who will have heavenly hope. Now, aside from noting their actual numbers, in this particular scripture, we can also see uh, some of the hallmarks of those who will be having this hope. But it says here, Revelation 14.1, Then I saw and looked the Lamb standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000 who have his name in the name of his Father written on their foreheads. How many will they be? Well, they will only be limited to 144,000. They will be joining Christ as uh, in his heavenly kingdom, and they will be ruling with him as kings as well. But did you notice the two hallmarks there? The first one is that they have the name of Jesus figuratively uh, put on their foreheads. That means these ones are Christians because they follow Christ. And what else? It says there that they also proudly bear the name of His Father also on their foreheads. And who is Jesus' Father? Well, deeper study of the Bible reveals that His name is known as Jehovah. So what can we get from here, dear ones? Well, those who have heavenly hope must come from the ranks of those baptized Christian servants of Jehovah. For what to qualify or to be chosen to have heavenly hope, they have to be baptized Christian servants of Jehovah. So really, the scripture gives us clarity for this one. But then again, we mentioned that there will be a vast majority that will also be here attending this memorial. And this vast majority will have the earth people. And that's something that we would like to look into. Well, what would be the point of focus for these ones? What would be they looking forward to? Well, there are several uh, scriptures that we can look into that really reveal some of the hope that these ones in the uh, with an earthly hope would really look forward to. For example, let's take a look at what is written in Isaiah chapter 11. Let's read verses 6 to 9. Now, this particular uh, scripture will be very tricky for children. Perhaps our little, our small ones will be uh, looking forward to this one. It says here, The wolf will reside a while with the lamb. And with the young goat, the leopard will lie down. And the calf and the lion and the fattened animal will all be together. And the little boy will lead them. And the cow and the bear will feed together. And their young will lie down together. The lion will eat straw like the bull. And the nursing child will play over the lair of a cobra. And the weak child will put his hand over the name of a poisonous snake. They will not cause any harm or any ruin in all my holy mountain. Because the earth will certainly be filled with the knowledge of Jehovah as the waters cover us. This clearly depicts the scenario very uh, Let's read together 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 25. He did the same with the cup also after they had the evening meal, saying, This cup means a new covenant by virtue of my blood. Keep doing this whenever you drink it, in remembrance of me. Yes, Jesus prayed and then offered the wine to his followers also. Now the red wine pictures his precious blood of the covenant, which is poured out in behalf of many for the forgiveness of sin. I would like to ask Father Rabba Maseda for the prayer. Let's pray. Our great and heavenly Father Jehovah, we come before you again this evening to thank you for uh, this uh, opportunity to show our appreciation and love to you. We reciprocate the greatest love that you've shown to us by giving yourself. We pray, Father Jehovah, to follow the pattern of uh, what is said by Jesus Christ. And as this uh, wine will be passed on, may you please help us to appreciate what it symbolizes, but most of all, please help us to assess ourselves and continue to show our appreciation even after this memorial to see how we can use our life to serve you 
and how we can maintain a very good relationship with our brothers and sisters. And uh, may you please continue to guide all our efforts, Father Jehovah, and may you bless everything that we do, especially on behalf of your name and your kingdom. Please forgive us for all our mistakes and shortcomings. All of these things we have to ask you to Jesus. Amen. We are very thankful that Jesus left us a pattern to follow. It's very, very simple. The focus not on the ceremonies itself, but actually the appreciation for what it meant for everyone who attended. On the word of appreciation, we now go to the fourth and last question that we would like, like to answer tonight. Aside from this meaning, what must we do to show our appreciation? Well, as we have mentioned earlier, Jehovah has this desire. He wants you to be a member of his family of worship. Jehovah wants you to be a member of his family of worshipers. So this means having a personal relationship. This means getting to know him through our study. This means having that relationship and growing into that relationship and being a baptized servant of Jehovah in the near future. Really, this is what Jehovah wants you to have. This is what Jesus' sacrifice opened up for us. His sacrifice opened up the way for us to have that precious relationship that we can have with Jehovah God. But that is something that we would really like to have. But of course, when we have a relationship with our Heavenly Father and we submit to His sovereignty, we need to follow the house rules. And that would be a wonderful reminder as was given to us in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 14 and 15. Now let's read that together. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 14 and 15. It says here, I am writing you these things, though I am hoping to talk to you shortly, but in case I am delayed, so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in God's household, which is the congregation of the living God, a pillar in support of the truth. Yes, we want to know how Jehovah wants us to behave in His gospel. We want to protect that precious relationship that we have with Him that was made possible by Jesus' loving sacrifice. But should we be afraid that it will be too complicated and too hard for us to follow? Well, it will have its challenges, but we must be encouraged that Jehovah will certainly help us. He will not leave us alone. He will give what we need so that we can continue to live by His standards. Because He wants us to be part of His family of worshipers. He wants us, He wants you and me to succeed in our relationship with Him. So when you are discouraged, because you seem to be failing in your relationship with Jehovah. What should you do? Well, don't fret. You can always come to Jehovah in prayer. You can always pour out your heart to Him. In that way, you will be building that faith that will be necessary for you to keep that relationship. And of course, part of that faith building would be the building up of knowledge. The building up of spiritual knowledge or accurate knowledge about Jehovah and Jesus Christ. Because the more you get to know Jehovah and Jesus Christ, the more you will love them. So we'd like to encourage everyone, our dear brothers and sisters, and even our dear guests, we would like to invite you, please, attend meetings regularly held by Jehovah's Witnesses in their kingdom. And there, you will learn more about Jehovah. You will learn more about Jesus Christ. Not only in this special occasion, but also in their regular meetings. In this way, we will be built up in our faith. We will have that warm relationship with Jehovah and Jesus Christ. As we end our program tonight, this is a thought that we would like to leave you. In the coming days and weeks, we will encourage you to please reflect on what is said in 1 John chapter 4, verse 9. That will be 1 John. 
chapter 4, verse 9. By this, the love of God was revealed in, your, in our case, that God sent His only begotten Son into the world so that we might gain life through Him. Huh? 